Thank you for joining our Revel 11 community this morning. I'm Monica Smith, one of the co-creators of Revel 11, along with Joni Parsons here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Joni and I started this women's speakers series, gosh, nearly five years ago now. And it always kind of seems like Joni has pursued topics that were more personal development and spiritually based. And I always pursue topics that are a little bit more health and science based. So this morning's topic of spirituality in the brain is just wonderfully aligned with everything we do. Everything. <laughs> and as some of you know, I had, um, I had brain surgery last December and I had a mini, I don't wanna call it mini, but a bit of a spiritual awakening myself through the preparation and recovery. And so I was so intrigued by Dr. Lisa Miller's story and her research. And I was absolutely thrilled when her publisher, Random House, was willing to send me her manuscript a few months ago. So that was just, I mean, it, the timing couldn't have been better. All of you should have received her background info so you know that she's already a New York Times bestselling author and professor in clinical psychology. So I'm so honored to have you join us today, Lisa. I am overjoyed to be here. I can't imagine anything I would enjoy more than speaking for a big group of women who <laughs> share both a passion for the journey, the spiritual quest, and have an eye towards science and health and wellness. So we really are wedding interests here and it's in just the right community. Um, perhaps I'll start by thanking you and telling you how extraordinary your organization is. This is exactly what women need and what humanity needs. Mm -hmm. I think that we are in the third wave of women's rights. The first was of course, basic civil rights. The second wave was jobs. And the third is bringing our way of thinking as women into the center of society as we now assume positions of impact and influence. So that is where the awakened brain lands. I think that what we're going to discuss today is a way of thinking and being and knowing that is very familiar to women. And yet oftentimes can feel deauthorized or minimized or marginalized in the boardroom, in the schoolroom, in the public square. And the awakened brain really is a science and a personal story that when wedded together says, yes, every woman, woman is a knower and our knowing is our greatest contribution. Let's take the very best part of ourselves that we bring to our home and our children and our families and put it in all spaces. So that's what I hope will be the message I, that this science authorizes our deep spiritual awareness. I just love that. I think that is so true. And I also think that some of that is because of languaging. Mm -hmm. And I think women are so much more comfortable maybe with the language around the awakened brain and spirituality. Mm -hmm. But I do want to talk about that a little bit since the word spirituality can be so fraught with angst about its meaning. Mm -hmm. So help us understand what you mean when you refer to spirituality. So I come to this both as a woman on her path and as a clinical scientist. From the lens of science, science doesn't define spirituality, but we identify threads within lived human spiritual life that bear enormous impact on the rest of our lives, our health, our wellness, our ability to love and connect, our ethics, our instrumentality and outward success. So I can share through the lens of science, those threads, and that is indeed what I do in the awakened brain, that really are absolutely tidal wave changing in our lives. And there are two. The first is our deep seat of transcendent awareness. We all have a hardwired capacity, day one, if we look through the lens of twin studies, we are born with this. A capacity, if we look through MRI studies, we can point to where it is in the brain to see into life at a deeper level. We have the equipment for an awakened brain. And yet that capacity is one third innate, two thirds developed, which means building the muscle is incumbent upon us as mothers to build in our children and as women 
to continue to build in ourselves that we might exercise and strengthen our awakened awareness, this neural seat of transcendent awareness. And what this seat of awareness allows us to do when our God-given birthright is realized and strengthened is to see into life a transcendent relationship. Now, to get to your important point, what we call that transcendent relationship differs wildly across faith traditions and cultures and personal views. In the United States, if you might envision an overlapping Venn diagram, two circles, spirituality and religion, two thirds of people say, I am spiritual and I am religious, whether Catholic, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, my deep spiritual experience is held through the prayers, the understanding, the community of my faith. About a third of the United States, 30% of millennials and fewer with each older and more with each younger generation say, I am spiritual, but I am not religious. For me, I feel spiritually connected in nature as I sit with my family in music or poetry or art. Whether or not spirituality is realized through religion or spirituality is realized outside of religion, it is the same neuro docking station. When we look in the MRI, the same circuits run. So we are all spiritual beings, whether or not we are religious. I use the word in the awakened brain. I'll show you, this is the awakened brain. And in the awakened brain, I chose the term awakened as opposed to spiritually awakened because it stays narrowly in my lane as a clinical scientist to, see, to speak of the seat of perception. We have the capacity for an augmented field of awareness, our awakened awareness, and it is our choice to realize it. The second dimension, I'll do this one more quickly, is that not only might we be awakened in our perception into life, be in a transcendent relationship with God, the force of life, Jesus, Hashem, spirit, life, the life force, not only may we see it and be in personal relationship, but also that it might be shared and that we might see in one another spirit or life force or God, that we're all God's children. To show up and view one another this way is as important as to have a direct connection. And in fact, one fuels the other. When we practice love of neighbor, we build the muscle and see the presence of spirit or God more clearly and vice versa. So we are embodiments, we are messengers. We are part of this symphony of life where we can show up for one another in an awakened way, an awakened heart. Okay, I'm that, that's how the, the, you arrived at it. Like in your history of school and your early jobs, like do you feel like you were already awakened, or and and so you wanted to dig deeper in the science of it, or was it the other way around? Thank you. That's um, you know I. I'll put it this way. As a child, I had a deeply spiritually connected mother and I knew that the spiritual level of reality was true. Yet that said, you know, I couldn't wait to start kindergarten and talk about this. You know, I could feel the numinousness as a child. I could feel that trees were alive and animals were in connection with us. So kindergarten was hot on my list as a young child. And when I got there, I was stunned that no one was talking about this grand symphony of life. So I waited and I had first grade and fifth grade and high school and college and sitting in the front row of psychology classes in college, I still was waiting to hear about this great symphony of life and I didn't, not a peep. And it occurred to me that the field I loved, which was clinical science had absolutely nothing to say about spiritual life. Now, all the while that I was getting trained in science, I was also a therapist and I could see that my patients had an entirely different road of recovery through darkness, through trauma, through loss, um, through real pain. Like does tomorrow matter? Do I matter? Is it worth living? Real despair. If they felt there was the presence of the transcendent relationship, if they felt that no matter how bad things got, they were loved, held and guided by God, by life itself, whatever their word would be. So what I could see from having grown up with a spiritual mother was nowhere in the training or the practice of psychotherapy in mainstream academic centers. And in fact, what I saw was that patients were getting worse when it was omitted. And I share in the awakened brain a real tragedy because the patient's personal spirituality was not regarded. So there was a crisis I felt in mental health. People had you know, pre-digital age charts this thick. There was a revolving door 
admitted, admitted again to the inpatient, admitted a fourth, fifth time. Mental health wasn't working. And that looked to me like work to be done. So I would say that as a scientist, I knew there was a problem, but nothing in the science had yet to speak to this emptiness, this donut sized hole in the heart of mental health. Is it also, true I think, that let me just interject this because you'll probably sure. answer it anyway. But is it is it true that only in recent history, modern medicine and spirituality have become separated? So the 20th century was an ice age when it came into the sciences and medicine on the integration of spirit. I mean, it was a cold freeze. And through most of the 20th century, spirituality was held and kept alive either through religious institutions or through the humanities. It was still in art and music and theater or frankly, through women. And this is where you know, we are so important. There were so many rich spiritual conversations held among women privately. You know, if a woman had cancer, she'd speak about it from a spiritual perspective privately to another woman. Um, in the awakened brain, I share my own battle with infertility and depression. And the, the only thing that made sense in this journey was a spiritual perspective. Um, actually, if I might, can I say a few words about that? Is that okay? Of course, please. Yeah. Um, so in addition to being a scientist and a psychologist and seeing the struggle with despair in my patients and seeing the lack of spiritual support, through the years of study and having a practice and becoming running a lab, I also had a a personal life. And the greatest challenge to face me and my spouse was that after five years of praying for children, of seeking for children, of wanting so much to conceive, no babies came. And this was absolutely devastating. Um, it was, you know, we had the jobs we wanted, we had the lives we wanted, and this, this nothing mattered. We were in deep despair. And each time that we didn't get pregnant, we'd ratchet up the medical treatment. So, you know, first we moved from IUI to in vitro. And after a few in vitros didn't work, we thought, well, maybe we should change doctors. And we kept ratcheting up, well, let's go to the people who invented in vitro using sea urchins in Woods Hole. No, okay, but this group over here in San Francisco, they have better rates. We kept approaching it from what I call the achieving brain. Let's solve the problem. Let's strategize, let's be tactical. And yet in my gut, in my heart, um, as a woman, I knew that that might exactly be the treatment for a fellow woman, but it wasn't where I was supposed to be. I was in the wrong office. I was in the wrong room. It just felt wrong that I wasn't finding the lesson somehow. What is life showing me now? What is life asking of me now? Um, it wasn't a medical problem in our case. So I opened my eyes more and more through the suffering, through the disappointments, right when it got really bad, to the fact that every time the bottom really dropped out, someone would show up to say the most beautiful, helpful thing. So for instance, um, I just had a failed fourth in vitro. I was completely depressed. I was lugging it into Columbia. I get on the bus, I sit down, and this quite unusual man gets on the bus right after me. And as synchronicities go, um, they're never immediately wanted. And the first thing I think is, is he really gonna sit next to me? I'm not feeling so hot. He's quite an unusual man. And he comes over, he sits down right next to me. And he says, you know, you look just like that type of woman that would go all over the world adopting kids. And I thought adoption, I'm like, it's funny, I just had my fourth in vitro. What is that talking about? Adoption, remarkable. Fifth in vitro. My husband and I are indeed with the team that invented in vitro on sea urchins. And we're sitting in a, you know, out of solidarity, my husband's by my side on bed rest. And we reach for the remote to watch the TV. And at this nice hotel, there's only one channel, one channel. And I click the remote and it's stuck. And there I am full of sort of like a pin cushion, all sorts of bruises and hopes, but also doubts. And what should come on TV, this one channel incessantly for hours, but a documentary of a child, a street child who is orphaned, living on a big pile of garbage in Central America. And through the translator, 
the child says to us sitting in bed, I don't care that I can't go to school. I don't care that I live in a garbage dump, but it hurts so much to not be loved that I sniff glue to make the pain go away. And I thought, I looked at my husband and I said, this little boy wanted parents and here we are, you know, ratcheting up the medical inventions. We could have been parents. He could have had a family. He's miserable, we're miserable. And it's all because I was blind to the possibility. I was blind to the more unitive sense, the family of life sense, the oneness sense through which we could have been family. And so enough of these synchronicities piled up that we finally got the picture. There's a child out there for us. And that we just had to figure out how to find this child. So just as the trail angels, as I call them, appear, right? The guy on the bus, the little boy in the garbage dump, another trail angel comes. And this time it's someone from the home court. It's my older cousin. My name's Lisa Jane. She's Big Jane. I've always looked up to her. She's about you know, eight years older. I just admire her so. Big Jane calls out of the blue as trail angels appear, as synchronicities arise. And she says, you know, I know you're really into the science of spirituality, but why don't you come out here and see real, real living spiritual healing? Next week, I have four days notice, is the healing ceremony in the Anipi with the Lakota. And they've said that I can bring you. So I hop on the plane. I go out to see the Lakota in South Dakota. We go to the most exquisite healing ceremony. One person stands up before the whole Lakota community and tells what has brought them here today to seek healing. It could be a story of abuse. It could be a story of loss. It could be some story of trauma. Every member of the Lakota community listens, riveted, whether this person speaks for two minutes or five minutes or for an hour. No one moves, they're all present. And when she or he is finished with their testimony, the drums start, everyone rises, and the entire community lines up single file to say each from their own heart what they feel inspired by the higher power. When all that's done, the next person gets up. So this ceremony was eight, 10 hours. No one moved, people were deeply present. And when all had spoken and all had been spoken to, we moved to the Anipi, the sweat lodge. Here in the sweat lodge, the women were in one, the men were in another. The woman who introduced herself as the medicine man's wife ran the women's sweat lodge. And as we went around, each woman stated why she had come today, now. The first woman said, my son is 40. He's not coming home anymore. I'm so worried for his children. The next woman says, my son is 14. He started drinking. I'm worried that he... the next woman says, my son, my son, my son. They get to Big Jane and I will be last. And Big Jane says, I have come with my cousin, Little Jane. And at this point, I can't even speak. I'm tongue tied, tears in my eyes. Little Jane is searching for her child. And I'm wondering if we can help her. Everyone is completely on the same page, completely tuned in. Yes, they understand. Can we help her? Perhaps here in the Anipi, we can help her. It comes to me and I can't even speak. The medicine man's wife leads us in a deep prayer ceremony and together we throw up our prayer through the top of the sweat lodge and you could see it you could, with your mind's eye, new, the numinous presence. And it was all of our prayers, but there was also the superordinate collective prayer sent up through the top of the Anipi. So to this day, um, it is a miracle for which I am so grateful to God. I get a call. Um, I picked it up the next day in South Dakota, calling into my machine. The call had come that night. And after five years, they said, there are magnificent children, but you know, we know that we have found the Miller's son. This is a son, like the sons in the Anipi. They had helped us, and so had God. 
or whatever your word might be. And that was our spiritual son. Um, absolutely. The video comes just a few weeks later. I pop it in. And the second I see him, my depression falls away. My struggle, my despair, my absolute pain is gone. And I feel an exquisite elevation and ec ecstatic euphoria. Like I've never felt this beautiful soul. And he's you know, in a Russian orphanage. So da, da, da. And he has his arm around the nurse. And in that moment, I became a parent. I became a parent because I felt a love that was so great. And it wasn't because he looked like me or was smart like my spouse or was, you know, it was a love that was so great, this beautiful child. And I realized that parenting is love and commitment. Not only that, there's, there's, you know, there's more in the awakened brain, but, but basically the moment that in my heart, I knew that was my son. I knew my spiritual son had come. We conceived his spiritual twin, his sister. And it was and, so yeah. much, it sounds like opening your eyes to a new possibility, a new way to think about it. And I'm curious about, for those of us who don't feel as, I don't know, connected or, or knowing what an awakened brain is, how do we recognize an invitation for it? I think at moments of great joy and illumination and very often at moments of great pain and despair when I don't get what I want and it could have been something really well-intentioned. It's not necessarily like money or something. When I, you know, when someone I love dies, when someone, you know, to be a parent is to give, but with something that's very well-intentioned, I still don't get what I want. And I do A plus B plus C and it should be in the bag. And I'm a good guy or good woman. And, you know, it's not adding up. A plus B plus C doesn't equal D. Then there's a breakdown of understanding the world as a place of strategy or tactics, what I call achieving awareness of making things happen, instrumentality. And that is the opportunity of our lifetime to look more deeply, to open our heart to another form of knowing what I call receptive, spiritual awakened awareness, a sense of what is life showing me now? Not am I the maker of my path, but can I be as well a discoverer of my path? Maybe there's a hairpin turn in my path that life is calling for now. And not only that, I could have absolutely no idea where I'm going. Um, actually, could we do an exercise? Would you be open to that? 100%. Okay, let's, let's do an exercise. Um, I call this the road of life. And I'm going to invite you to clear out your inner space. And then we'll go through a series of visualizations. It's always, always an invitation. It's up to you to choose. So five breaths. I invite you to locate a time where you had planned and gotten everything set up. A plus B plus C. It may have been you were about to, you'd done everything for a job. You had that promotion in the bag. You knew that the two of you were gonna get married. You knew that this was just the school for you or for your child. Everything was lined up. And somehow it was far too unprobabilistic to have happened by chance, but there was an impasse. That red door was stuck shut. So you pulled the handle. That red door you'd been working for, you had it all lined up. It made no sense. How could it be? And you knocked the door, you rattled the door. It was completely jammed. You may have even hit your head or kicked the door. It was disappointing. It was anxiety provoking. It was a loss of what had been envisioned. What did it feel like? Where were you? But only because that red door was stuck, you pivoted, you shifted and looked over your right shoulder. It could have been 60 degrees. It could have been 120 degrees. Only because that red door was stuck, you turned and you discovered a yellow door. And this yellow door opened freely. 
swung wide open. And it led to a landscape that you hadn't even known was possible. You may have walked by that yellow door had you only been focused on the red door. You may have perhaps not even known the yellow door was there. You may have met someone. It may have been a whole new type of career change. It may have been the child like Isaiah coming his own way, but the yellow door swung open and changed everything. And how fluid was that? And now I invite you to reflect, was there a messenger somewhere between the red door that was so frustrating and depressing and disappointing and your awareness of the yellow door? It could have been a friend, a colleague. It could have been a grandparent. It could have been the guy on the bus or something you suddenly saw, a book you read. Was there a messenger, if you will, a trail angel that helped you with this hairpin turn to see the yellow door? And when you're ready, I invite you back. You may choose to draw. I'll give you just, if you want 30 seconds to draw your road of life through this passage, the red door, the yellow door, the hairpin turn, and insert messenger, trail angel. And looking at this road of life, is there perhaps a dialogue between us as journeyer and the guiding hand, the spirit in and through all life that is in us, through us, and among us, in and through the trail angel, the messenger, in and through the stuck red door, in and through the open yellow door. Is there a dynamic dialogue? Do synchronicities point the way? Too unprobabilistic to have happened by chance. Two things that from a material perspective look like two things mourning the loss of the third in vitro and the guy on the bus mentioning adoption. Those were in two physical different points, but it was part of one field of life. We are a point and we are a wave. Now I might invite you to take this moment and write two more times on the side of your paper where this has happened, where that red door was stuck and from the view of achieving awareness where we do strategize and we need in life to strategize and have some layer of control that alone was insufficient. And the deeper nature of flux and dynamism, the loving guiding presence in and through life took you to the yellow door because you said yes. So this is not a model of send it out and get what you want. This is a model of deep relationship with a loving guiding, always evolving universe. And I'm going to add I, one more little piece. Oh, sure, okay. please. No, 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 no. Go ahead. One more I'll little piece. Okay. okay. Now I'd like you to clear out your space, just three breaths this time. I invite you to think of a time where you may have been a trail angel to someone else when you were the messenger. You may have felt inspired to say something and you didn't know why. You may have felt a tug to just show up or call, or it may have been quite spontaneous at the moment, not even realizing the high impact you had. I invite you to write when you were a trail angel and how the divine presence moves through you. When you're ready, I invite you back. Jot that down. What I found um, powerful about that exercise is that it's it's more like past tense. It's more of a reflection than an exercise for what is currently going on in your life. And I, and I think that that's a really interesting approach because it sometimes makes me wonder about just the nature of slowing down and being reflective 
is that part of a spiritual practice or a practice to gain an awakening? So let us regard the yellow door that showing up and honoring the high pixel information in this moment. What did the guy on the bus just say? That being deeply present, you know, mindful is, is the threshold of presence through which we can cross over into awakened awareness. We first have to stop the racket. Right? And in fact, in the awakened brain, the first of the four dimensions is that we simply show up and are present so that we see the yellow door so that the guy on the bus actually isn't just annoying, but he said something to me. Um, that, that, you know, then it's not annoying that the TV is stuck, but we're going to watch the homeless boy. Really, what is life showing me now? What is life telling me now? I think that's beautifully put that we see it, that we regard this instant as replete and abundant with information, with love, that there's the gift of this moment. The guy on the bus was a gift in my view of spirit, of life, of God, right? We are all emanations like the sun rays from source, whatever your words might be. So when we show up on the road of life, you know, we're the trombone and the violin in the great symphony. Um, we're really important to one another. Relationships are spiritual events. Women already know this. We know this when we're teenagers. When I visit schools around the country, girls pull me aside and say, my relationships, they have God in them. Or girls will say, things happen for a reason. She came into my life just when my mother died. They understand us. This is our birthright. And in fact, when we look at the data, um, women are 50% more likely than men to be depressed. But when we have a strong spiritual life, that difference goes away. I think a lot of the suffering in women is because we feel silenced in our deep spiritual awareness and in expressing it outwardly. And when we own that, we are made whole and strong and who we are meant to be. I kind of feel that way. I mean, I kind of feel like as women that we're more in touch, but I really want to explore this more for those of us in the audience that sure. it's like, how can we on a daily basis, I feel like how many times in life have these instances where there has been these two doors and I haven't even recognized it. So like, does this happen so frequently and we're just getting life done that we don't see it? And so I would love your recommendation for all of us and how on a daily basis can we stay aware? Great, beautiful. Okay. To start with that beautiful point, when you see a yellow door, you know, there's a perturbation, something, it often starts with, uh, a bump in the road, something that was in the bag didn't add up, um, something quite unusual happened. My child just said something. I often found our children are carriers, right, of, of spiritual life. So when we were late because it took 20 minutes to get out of the house, we actually showed up at the right time. The children are great carriers for us. Um, but really looking at the surprises, um, the unevenness, the unplanned, the, foi the foibling of our plans as spirit, spirit speaking. Spirit, I'll give you an example. I was trying to get from New York to Miami two days ago and four very unlikely things got in the way to the point where we were three and a half hours delayed. You know, I'm sorry, I can't put you on this flight. The computer says, no, I'm sorry. Someone just blew a tire on the runway. Um, we're gonna sit another hour. I'm sorry, there's rain, we can't land. And at some point I said, what is life showing me now? And I got off the plane, went to bed, went home, came back the next day. The Uber driver and I had one of the most profound discussions of my life the next day on the way to the airport. And when I got there for that two hour delayed flight, I met an elder couple who I will always remember who changed my life of what's po possible for family. I probably had four of the most meaningful discussions I've had in a year yesterday because I got off the plane. So what is life showing me now? And it's, you know, sometimes the volume will get a little louder till we hear it. You know, it's not enough that I can't get on the flight. We have to sit on the runway an hour. It's not enough that we sign it. So this is, this is an opportunity when I really am not controlling 
when control is a very thin layer of icing on a big pound cake of flux and dynamism. And when there's these moments where I'm not getting my way, that's an opportunity. Don't hit the keyboard harder, sit back and reflect. Those are openings. And of course, the more serious and painful ones are openings too, like infertility, like loss of people we love. Um, these are openings too. Actually, may we do one more exercise? Do we have time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we are running, it's time is going by very fast, but yes. 90 seconds. Okay, this is um, effectively in the awakened brain, I talk about the neural seed of awareness. This is the experience. This is employing, this is powering up, turning on, opening up your awakened brain is what we'll do, may, may we? And as always, I, I like to honor the person who taught me this practice. This practice was taught to me by Dr. Gary Weaver who helped people awaken. Okay, I'm going to invite you to breathe out five breaths. And then we will do, after five breaths, a 90 second visualization, five breaths. I invite you to set before you a table. This is your table. And to your table, you may invite anyone, living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. Anyone living or deceased who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, ask them if they love you. And now you may invite your higher self, the part of you that is so much more than what you've done or not done, anything you have or don't have, your true eternal higher self and ask you if you love you. And now you may invite your higher power, whatever word you may use, however you may know your higher power and ask your higher power if they love you. And now with all of those people sitting there right now, what do they need to tell you now? What do you need to know? What do they need to share right now? When you're ready, I invite you back. This is your counsel and they are always there for you. Who shows up may change depending on where you are in your road of life. And what you may ask may come forward based on where you are in your road of life. This is your birthright, your awakened brain to always know that you are loved you are held, you are guided, and you are never alone. Thank you so much. This is what life is showing me right now that was so perfect for me. Thank you. I'm so grateful. Thank you. You had mentioned um, depression a few minutes ago, yes. and it is something that I do want to touch on since depression is so prevalent, especially I think right now. Um, and you had mentioned in the book about 
spirituality and depression being two sides of the same coin. And I really want to understand that more. So very oftentimes when we are depressed, about two thirds of the time, it is not medical pathology. It is a developmental process and the depression is signaling something true. So too, when we're anxious, it is signaling something. We are right. There is something in the way we see, in the way we live that is perhaps going around around us that is accurately depressogenic. So we need not always assume and locate depression as an illness in the person. Now, what is that? Well, depression as a signal, you know, if I put my thumb on a hot stove, I pick up heat. Well, that's really hot, right? I'm, I'm picking something up as a signal. Depression too is a signal. We're picking something up. It is an invitation to a deepening of our awareness that there's some way that I'm living. Think of back to my story of searching for Isaiah that is yet I have blinders on. I've even perhaps closed my eyes. I've yet to wake up. I've yet to awaken to the bigger, more abundant, real picture at hand. So I want a child and I'm not getting pregnant. I want a child and I'm not getting pregnant. Or right now, half of our country is depressed. The past 18 months is not as we'd planned it. The past 18 months was not as what. This is very painful in and of itself, but it's even more painful when told through the lens of control of what I call achieving awareness. Is there a deeper, bigger picture that I can open my eyes to, that I can pull off the blinders and see as in our journey in finding our spiritual child where not only is there a lesson, for instance, in our case, that parenthood is love and commitment. It's not a kid who looks just like me. And even deeper yet, is there a stance in living that is more full, more illuminating, more abundant, which shows far more shine and promise? There, is there a reality to which I can awaken that is indeed hardwired and ready to go if I flip on the switch? where I'll see many more opportunities, many more magnificent surprises, many more relationships. So depression is a knock at the door to awakening. It is a painful road, but it is a very real road. And we are eminently equipped and endowed with the capacity to break through to an augmented perceptual field where life is abundant. And there are surprises, my beautiful Isaiah and his spiritual twin. And yes, you know, I lost senior prom, says my daughter, and I go to college with a mask. There were losses, but what did I gain? You know, for our children, there is nothing on the desk that compares to the lesson of the past 18 months. I always say, God willing, they're safe. God willing, they're fine. Their lives are likely going to see enormous flux, enormous dynamism, I think, which will very much eclipse this past 18 months. The best education for our child is how to adopt a stance in a dynamic, uncertain world. Instead of the little rowboat of control, how can we help them get up on top of the tsunami through this stance of a dynamic dialogue with life? What is life showing me now? What is the opportunity? That red door is slammed. Where is the yellow door? And who are these trail angels along the way? A living dynamic relationship with spirit, with God, with the force of life in and through us all is a stance in living, an awakened stance that will allow our children to live in a very volatile world. And that's an education. It comes from us as parents. It can be put into schools, but there's no one more impactful than a mother. Um, okay, so I'm still trying to dig at the, so for someone who does feel depressed, and I know that in the book, you talk a lot about someone can focus their perception and how they feed their inner life. Um, and so talk about that mechanism and, and choosing which path you, you take. We have a choice at every moment. And you know, I invite you to identify the feeling inside yourself. Um, something's going wrong. I'm feeling stressed. Maybe I'm feeling an overdrive when things aren't working, that is a time where what I call achieving awareness is not working. It's not squaring with the truth of the moment. 
right? And it is often very depressing. Um, these moments that aren't working are an invitation, are a beginning. They're not just a loss, they're not lost time, they're not a crater, they're not a pothole. They are beginning to try another way, to try something else. And here's where I invite you to ask, what is life showing me now? And what does my deep inner resonance say about that? So for instance, the council visualization that we just did, what does my awakened awareness, what does my seat of receptive inspired perception, whether it's through prayer, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through the inspiration of walking through the woods. But when I go from being locked into the little cage of awareness to open, connected with all life, that feeling when you're on the top of a mountain or you're looking out at the ocean or you're in a deep state of prayer by your parents or grandparents or you're looking at your child. And there's these moments of, of awe, of unity, of oneness, where we're aware that we're both a point and a wave. In that state of unit of awareness, in that state of connection, how do you feel there? Right. And actually from the lens of science, when we look at people to recover from depression through moving from the cage of isolation, opening their eyes and feeling that deeper sense through prayer, through nature, through meditation to the oneness that we're connected to one another as sisters and brothers that were connected to all life, that our dog loves us, that the sun knows us, that we're connected. We're not alone. We're using our awakened brain, right? The, the loops in the awakened brain are the bonding network that lets us feel held, like when we were children. A bottom up, instead of just a narrow top down, a bottom up attention network that sees the yellow door. And in fact, many people say it allows us to see that it pops, inspired awareness the parietal that puts in and out hard boundaries. So no, I'm not alone. The guy on the bus actually cares about me. And hey, I actually care about that child on the street. We're not alone. We share a common human heart. We are loved, we are held, we are guided, and we are never alone. That is a perception. That is, and so far as I look at a book, on some level the book is real because I perceive it. We are hardwired to see, we are loved, held, guided, and never alone. That is a perception into a nature, a level of reality. And why as a scientist do I take that to be real? Not just that I can see it, because it bears fruit every time. It has proven itself infinitely, far more consistently than we've happened by chance. So this is our birthright and life opens up. There's more surprises. There's freedom, such freedom from the narrow cage. And it's ours, it's all of ours. It's not the most pious, it's not the best hit monks, it's all of ours. And as women, when we own this and speak through this, we give our children that clarity and everyone comes to count on us to be that voice. Wendy, thank you so much for asking this question. And I think you kind of just Good. answered it, but is anxiety, fear, being frozen versus depression, a similar door to being invited to be awakened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anxiety and depression often go hand in hand. Um, and anxiety very often, as, as we know, in addition has a feeling that of, of fear, of unsafety, that somehow I'm gonna be annihilated. And it doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna be physically annihilated, but that something in my ecosystem is annihilating. Um, so in addition to the fact that depression and anxiety often go hand in hand, anxiety is actually a helpful friend. Um, it says something here doesn't square with who I am. I need to change something in my ecosystem or how I sit within my ecosystem because anxiety is not always pathology. It's a signal. It's a signal that's often an accurate signal of misalignment that my deep soul, my deep truth is somehow not being honored, is not being nourished, is not right. Um, so it goes hand in hand, it's an invitation, um, but it's, it's often um, in addition, um, more of something that right here in my ecology, something may not be right. Um, we're, I can't believe we're already out of time, but I do want you to mention about the 
resilience that you build up through the practice and what your brain scans have shown. When we choose to use our awakened brain, when we use awakened awareness and see life as a dialogue, you know, where is the yellow door? And wow, who's on the other side? And life is far bigger and more interesting than what I had planned. We're using the seat of awakened awareness day in and day out. It's a form of spiritual connection, a form of dialogue with our higher power, like at your council table or the inspiration that we bring to one another or your grandmother may have shared with you. When we use our awakened brain, we build it like a muscle. What we see in our MRI studies is that sustained use of awakened awareness, a spiritual look into life day in and day out, creates strength, if you will, thickening of the cortex in regions of perception, reflection, and orientation. So I can be in the same house with the same family and have the same job, and it all looks different through my awakened brain when I've strengthened the capacity to see the transcendent presence, the sacred, the abundance in and through life. Those regions to show thickness, the parietal, pecunious, and occipital are not thick, but thin in people with recurrent major depression, suggesting that awakened awareness, a spiritual view into suffering, treating depression as an opening, a knock at the door for a deepening of our spiritual life. When we do that, we strengthen the awakened brain and we are neuroprotected against subsequent depressions. So not only do we gird ourselves against the depth of the next suffering, we are less likely to be as pain. We are less likely because life is more abundant. We also discover a promise that is more shining and more magnificent than we might ever have imagined because we're seeing a much bigger world through the lens of our awakened brain and then inhabit it and it becomes our lives. Okay, if that is not the perfect invitation to develop our awakening, I don't know what it is. Thank you so much. I'm so bummed that we're out of time, out of time because well, I could talk there's about more this exercises so in the awakened brain in the back. There's references so you can pull up the science articles and throughout the type of practices we did, you can do do on your own. But I might suggest a journey group, a sangha, a minion, a fellowship. Four great women, idea. Six women, eight women together. Share it. Yeah. Also, listen to Dr. Miller's um, TEDx talk. It's fabulous. And there is the best story in there about the ducks that I just want. I really wanted you to share the duck story today, but we don't have time now. But please, there's so much information. And um, I am so enjoying this journey myself. And it has really changed my life. So, I want to thank you, Lisa, for that. I'm so, very grateful. Thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you. Well, um, I hope everyone has a great day. We are going to um, go through upcoming events. But Lisa, again, thank you for your time. And I look forward to watching your journey from here on out. Good, look, good luck with the new book as well. Thank you. It's been a joy and I really could feel your group. I went through and I could feel your great love and presence as a community. It's an honor to be here today. Thank you. We're honored to have you. Thanks.